Okay, we should start. Thank you all for coming. It's really wonderful to see you here. This is the first of, the, of our series of uh, forums for the year. Uh, and it's really great to have this um, happening in the second year. Uh, it's really a testimony to uh, our strengths in women's studies that we have enough faculty to uh, give talks all last year and all this year and maybe even next year <laughs> before we get back to the same people again. <laughs> and then they'll have new thoughts and they'll be working on a new project, so they'll have something new to talk about. Uh, the, the, the purpose of the forum, I know many of you have already been here, so you know about it already, but this is something that we did start last year as an idea of primarily to give a uh, arena for faculty who are here to talk about their work so that we would all know what each other was doing. And it is so often that we have outside speakers from a variety of places and for a variety of reasons, but it's not that often that we actually just focus on what we're doing here. Uh, it's not exclusively devoted to faculty presentations, however, and we also, well, for one thing, we, we always try to bring uh, students in to respond to the talks as we'll do tonight, and we last year had at least one panel in which several students uh, participated, and we had at least one uh, visiting scholar uh, give a talk last year as well, and I know there's a number of, of, of uh, of uh, fellows here from the WSRP program this year, uh, and we would be happy to have some of you also present your work in this forum too, if you would like to, so let us know about it. But anyway, it's really great to see the same people here over and over again, plus also to see the new people, but especially to keep coming, and so we kind of have a kind of growing sense of just what's happening around here, and, and we're, we're better informed to talk to each other, and we know what some of us are thinking about, and that maybe some sort of distinctive style of women's studies and gender studies and feminist thought will begin to emerge from our group, and, and we'll go down in history for that. <laughs> so tonight I'm so delighted and thank very much Laura Nasralla who agreed to do it tonight, especially because Laura is on leave, and even though one thinks that one has all kinds of free time, uh, actually, as we all know, time is some th weird things happening with time these days, and it's only getting worse, and time is e eaten up. And so actually, it's kind of a big thing to do this. Even if you're just giving a talk that you've given in another place, it really takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. So it's like about a five-day kind of like toll on the person who has to do it. Not really. But anyway, <laughs> thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it for you to come out and talk to us. Um, everyone knows Laura Nasrallah, I think, but anyway, she's a sister professor of New Testament and early Christianity. Some of you might not realize that her BA is from Princeton and that she in fact is a, a daughter of these very halls. She got her MDiv and a THD here at the Divinity School. And um, uh, she has a book already out called An Ecstasy of Folly, Prophecy and Authority in Early Christianity. And I believe that her talk tonight is part of her new project, which is something about early Christian literature in the Roman Empire, and she's looking at all kinds of interesting things like geography and archaeology, and as we're going to hear tonight, statuary. Uh, the title of her talk is The Pedagogical Image, the Gendered Body, Greco-Roman Statuary, and the Early Christian Imagination. Uh, and afterwards, uh, we will have three uh, students, uh, Rachel Smith, who is a PhD student, uh, Bob Davis, who is an MTS student, and um, Charles Stank, who is a THD, each offer just a couple of conversation openers and questions, and then uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to have some discussion. So thank you, Laura. Thank you all for coming out on a Monday night. I know it's not the most pleasant thing to do, and I want to thank Janet for her leadership in organizing WGR for two years running, and also thank um, Ann Browdy for inviting me to be a faculty affiliate with the WSRP, so I get to hear um, wonderful works from five new colleagues across the street. Thank you also to the students who have taken out their time to respond to me this evening. In the Roman period, the pedagogos who led the children of the elites to school and back home was often a Greek slave. My title tonight has the phrase, the pedagogical image, not only because I will consider ancient discussions of what naturalistic images of the bodies of humans and gods teach, but also because I will discuss Greek objects that were purchased, stolen, replicated, interpreted, and displayed by Roman elites. These images are like the enfleshed and owned pedagogos, who by virtue of being a slave was not only a person, but also an object. 
They take every viewer by the hand and lead him or her somewhere. Images, particularly Greek or Hellenizing statuary bodies, are thus like the Pythagogos' body, far from home, enslaved, leading the eye to learn about Greek paideia, culture or education, through the lens of Roman domination. At the same time, Greek images stolen and copied by Rome demonstrate that the colonized has some kind of superiority and power to lead or even to enslave the viewer with its iconographic power. Part of my current research argues that what is missing from scholarship on early Christian texts, specifically second century texts that are usually labeled apologies from the Acts of the Apostles to Justin and others, is an understanding of the broader material environment in which they were produced. You know, I think, the power of place and the power of images. There are images that are impressed sharply on our minds of someone we yearn for or something we fear. There are places which we desire viscerally, perhaps even places that war or poverty has erased. And of course, there are spaces where some of us, given our particular bodies, can walk with confidence while others walk with fear and danger. We are shaped by the space in which we live and move and have our being, to pick up the Greek philosophical phrase that Luke, writer of the Acts of the Apostles, puts in the mouth of the Apostle Paul. Tonight, I want to bring together these themes of body and space by exploring with you three threads that run through my current research. First, how would early Christian literature read differently if placed in the context of the built environment, especially the urban environment where marble and bronze bodies crowded in the fleshy bodies of the populace? Second, what does it mean to live in a culture where the cityscape is full of naturalistic or veristic statuary that not only teases the mind as to what is true and what is deceitful, but that also blurs the human and the divine? Imagine, what would it do to you to stand on a street, warmer, drier than here, less brick and more marble, crowded with images and statues where everywhere around you, you see an emperor that looks like a god, an empress that looks like a goddess, elite that looks like the emperors or sculpt themselves with divine attributes, and even the gods whose faces resemble those of the imperial family. What might these images teach? Third and finally, what would it mean to live and to walk in that city roughly 2,000 years later and to resist being seduced by the pedagogical power of its ghostly statuary population? Although many would argue that archaeological finds and material culture offer us hard evidence, rock hard in fact, empirical and scientific and easier to interpret than literary text, I think otherwise. Architecture makes statements. Statues speak too. I am mighty. Here we have Hadrian with his foot on a barbarian. I am virtuous and pious. And this is somehow not working. There you go. That is Livia holding the bust of Augustus, her drapery falling off her shoulder as if she is a sort of Venus and holding the attributes of Ceres or Demeter. Or I am wise. Here's Marcus Aurelius gazing philosophically outwards. Feminist and post-colonial criticisms teach us to ask, what would it mean to be a viewer who sees and resists? To be a viewer who walks the city not with the knowledge of an elite, but with that of a slave who does not own or control her own body, who is aware from her own experience of bodies of all sorts and their uses. But before I turn to this broader question of images in the second century city, I need to give you at least a glimpse of early Christian literature and more particularly what Christians of the second century said about images and image making. In some, they do not sound happy. In the Acts of the Apostles, Luke presents a Paul who comes to Athens and immediately is offended because the city is full of idols. Justin in the mid second century writes, neither do we Christians honor with many sacrifices and garlands of flowers the objects that people have formed and set in temples and named gods since we know that they are lifeless and dead and have not the form of God but have the names and shapes of those evil demons which have appeared. Athenagoras adds in tones of Jerry Springer, it is these demons who drag people to the images. They engross themselves in the blood from sacrifices and lick all around them. <laughs> Clement of Alexandria gives us the lovely image of barbarians who torture and kill their captives by binding them together to corpses until both rot. So also, he argues, the living are bound by superstition to wood and stone statues until both rot away together. So Christians are upset about images, and particularly about images of gods. You might think, as so many have, that this is not puzzling at all. 
Scholars have often argued that Christians condemn statues because of Jewish tradition and scripture, especially the second commandment of the Decalogue against the making and worship of images. But we have recently learned that Judaism in antiquity was not universally aniconic. Ancient synagogues were full of images of the zodiac of birds, even of prophets and patriarchs. And as soon as Christians had enough money to produce their own images, they did. Moreover, it's clear that Christians from the very start used common images and applied their own meanings to them. According to Clement, the very Clement who talked about rotting away with idols, a signet ring of a ship properly understood can be a Christian symbol. It is hard to distinguish a Christian image from a Jewish or pagan in the second century precisely because Christians were not necessarily different at all in their customs, their philosophies, their use of objects and symbols, in all those small acts that historians scrutinize to fix boundaries or to mark identity in antiquity. Scholars have a penchant for pithy definitions of the second century. Edward Gibbon described it as the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was the most happy and prosperous, sustained as it was by the so-called good emperors or not so good if you happen to be a Jew or a Christian. E.R. Dodds instead characterized the second century as the age of anxiety, painting its inhabitants as concerned about barbarian incursions and sweaty with hopes and fears about the immortality of the individual soul. While I am less inclined to make sweeping statements about a century, I will do so here in order to sketch the sort of spaces one would have seen in a Greek city under the Roman Empire or in Rome itself. There our eyes would not so much find an age of anxiety, but to borrow a phrase from poetry, a landscape of having to repeat. This repetition occurred on several interrelated levels. First, metropolitan centers under the Roman Empire were haunted with a ghostly, cool other population. Cassius Dio reported that in early first century Rome, quote, it was possible for anyone who wanted freely to display themselves in public in a painting or bronze or stone to do so. He literally uses the Greek term for mob or crowd to talk about how many statues were hanging around, a mob that clustered in particularly prominent places within the city and even hung off its architecture. This statuary was not small or easy to miss. It was well over life size with high technical elaboration and finish, as we'll see. Images were not only impressive, but overwhelmingly present. Even in the first century CE, Pliny had complained about the 3,000 statues erected on a temporary stage drop, a stage backdrop in a theater. Although Dodd's characterization of the second century as an age of anxiety isn't quite right, there is something anxiously performative about this time, a nearly endless repetition of statuary as if to reassure the city that the gods and true religion exist to reassure or assert that the imperial family was in control, to reassure elites that they are still here, and to reassure the cities or peoples who benefited by them that they will continue to be here, offering from their wealth for the benefit of the city. Second, in this landscape, there is a kind of repetition that has to do with ethnicity. Romans took the cultural products of those they conquered, especially the Greeks, and lifted these up not only as evidence of Roman military triumph, but also as beautiful and valued objects of culture. Romans often sought to appropriate their ethnicity. We can think in the phrase of a paterai of the social lives of these things. Classical and Hellenistic Greek images have a kind of biography, a life of moving through different cultures and spaces and of being valued in different ways. To borrow Horace's phrase, captive Greece took captive her savage conqueror in a few different ways. Paintings and images taken in war were paraded in Rome in triumphal celebrations alongside the enslaved bodies of prisoners of war. Tatian, a Christian writer, mockingly addressed the Greeks and told them that he has studied their great sculptures, but on a trip to Rome. Rome had stolen or purchased Greek cultural patrimony. Moreover, in the social lives of these Greek objects, the Romans hotly produced what we should not call copies of Greek statuary, but rather interpretations of their own as with this classically Greek figure called Doriphoros, the spear bearer. In terms of his social life, this canon, this rule of Greek masculinity, resurrects in many and various forms in the Roman world, even as a kind of kitschy candelabra. The Romans not only repeated Greek statuary, signaling their valuing of Greek culture, their men also began to look, in a way, Greek. In the second century, it came into vogue to look not like the clean-shaven, hard, cheek-boned Augustus, but like a bearded Greek philosopher with a middle-distance gaze. On the left, you'll see Herodes Atticus, 
the exceedingly wealthy sophist of the second century, who chose to portray himself as a kind of new Demosthenes, the figure on the right. Despite his wealth and power, his head is down. He is thoughtful, humble, philosophical. He is iconographically similar, especially in terms of his beard, to his friend, the emperor Hadrian, that lover of Greeks and wearer of the philosophical beard. Another common repetition, since elites tend to adopt the hairstyles and pose of the imperial family. Marcus Aurelius, philosophical himself, echoes his predecessor Hadrian's beard, and of course the image of the emperor repeats itself across the empire. In sketching this landscape that repeats, we first have gotten a sense of the crowding of images and statuary in the city. Second, we've seen how Romans appropriated, commodified, and echoed the Greek culture that they conquered. Let me mention finally a third issue, that of repetition and ontology. In the second century city, human forms and divine forms repeat at such a pace that it is unclear, deliberately, in my opinion, what is an image of a god and what is an image of a human. Part of this unclarity emerges because of the imperial cult at the time, a practice where the imperial family is associated with the god and indeed become gods. Don't you thank God that our own presidents don't choose heroic <laughs> nudity? Yeah. Here again is the unwarlike Hadrian depicted as the god Ares, or the somewhat inept Commodus as the hero Heracles, ruling over the whole world on the, on the um, base of the bust underneath him. Hadrian's lover Antinous famously became a god or gods as Silvanus to your left and as Bacchus to your right. Fine, one might think. The emperors could do that. If you run the empire, you can certainly afford some statuary that makes you look like Zeus or Hera. But the emperors and those intimate with them were not the only ones to look confusingly but surely like the gods, to make us ask, is this a human body or a divine one? We find such theomorphic images among those whose names we do not know and likely never will. Here's a Roman man, slightly pudgy around the chin to my eyes, slightly sad or shy, presented at over two meters high as the hero Heracles in death. Here are Roman matrons in various poses as the goddess Venus or Aphrodite in a form that draws on the famous 4th century BCE sculpture of Aphrodite of Cnidos by Praxiteles. One example is imposing on your left, well over life size. The statue's height is 1.8 meters or 6.17 feet. She would have had a small cupid next to her or Eros. She probably dates to the late Flavian period. My students have said I have Flavian hair myself. And was found at a villa near Lake Albano. As all art historians point out, this aging, 30-ish, not so aging to my eye, drawn, uh, this aging woman has a drawn face and a fierce hairstyle that juxtapose incongruously with her rounded and youthful form. She's not the only Venus, an even more imposing sculpture at 2.14 meters or seven feet, likely dating to the Antonine period, mid to late second century, comes from Rome itself. This body too is a version of the Cnidian Aphrodite and this better preserved sculpture retains a young Eros gazing upward, an elaborate drapery held before the genitalia and tucked snugly around the right leg, behind the statue and over the left arm. The detail and linearity of the drapery contrast with and call attention to the soft, smooth flesh. These funerary monuments of the wealthy are puzzling. Where do they lead the viewer? Despite the Roman dislike of nudity, especially for high status women, these women wear the nudity of Venus as a kind of costume, to use the terminology of Larissa Bonfante. We can see here some rich possibilities for interpreting early Christian language of the flesh as a garment with which Christ and all humans put on and take off. We can also see rich possibilities for rethinking the idea of becoming a god. Their bodies, or is it the goddess's body, are soft and vulnerable and affect heightened by the sharp linear um, linearity of the second image's drapery and the tense face of the first. Their modest gestures, as the literature of the time names it, follow the form of the Canadian Aphrodite, but call attention to rather than conceal the genitalia. Aphrodite, or is it the women, are caught in the, in the decidedly ungodlike pose of being naked, bathing, their material and thus passive, enslaved in stone, forever attracting the gaze and protecting themselves from the viewer. They round their backs and shoulders to conceal their bodies. They do not have the encasing musculature of a Dorophos who stands comfortably, full frontal nude, unconcerned even as a ridiculous candelabra. 
Yet these female sculptured bodies are also perfect, undiseased, not battered by slavery, and oddly unmarked by the vulva. They might be described in art historical lingo to be both shamefully, honestly naked and artfully nude. But I think that they're neither. There's something in between. It is not only we who are perplexed by the meaning of the Canidia and her afterlives. There was quite a conversation about this image in antiquity, and Christian writers too mention her with great frequency, pointing to the licentiousness in which she was produced and which she produces. Two famous stories circulated in non-Christian circles to which Christians loved to allude. First, this so-called Aphrodite was actually modeled on the sculpture's hetera, his not-so-modest, not-so-defined courtesan lover. Second, the statue once installed in its temple on Knidos had the effect of making a young man fall in love with her, and he tried to have intercourse with the statue, leaving a stain on her thigh before throwing himself into the sea. The impenetrable stone is still stained, and the goddess was a whore. So then, what indeed is this repeating image supposed to teach? Art historians have speculated that such statuary arose for two reasons. First, the freedmen of the empire, former slaves, wanted to represent themselves and their families in prestigious ways. Second, those who depicted themselves as gods in their funerary monuments um, were seeking to collect for themselves the attributes of the, those gods, the various virtues and attainments of the deceased. These women wore Venus's nudity, the mother of all Romans through Aeneas, as a costume and were honored as exemplary mates, fertile and modest. But does this socioeconomic argument or even the idea of one's portrait body symbolizing divine virtues really exhaust the philosophical and theological questions such statuary evokes? Where are such images supposed to lead the viewer? We might think from what I've just said that everything in the second century was fairly straightforward, even if crowded with statuary. The Roman Empire and its wealthiest members liked its images of humans and gods. The Christians didn't, and that is the end of the story. But let me trouble a little what I have just presented about the second century cityscape, because many non-Christians in the Roman Empire did not easily accept this proliferation of statuary and imagistic bodies. Many in the ancient world asked a variety of questions about the appropriateness of this other population. Even in the first century BCE, Cicero critiqued Romans for stealing Greek objects, although he sought to purchase the same for his villa. Pliny complained that people disrespectfully would insert new heads into old statuary. Favorinus offered a powerful and funny oration to the Corinthian people who had erected a statue in his honor and then taken it down. In his speech, he argues on the statues, that is, on his own behalf. The anxiety regarding images extends beyond human representations to the gods. The second century Syrian writer Lucian, writing in sophisticated Greek, seems to mock the gods, saying that even the most beautiful of their statues, those that are chryselephantine of ivory and of gold, are filled inside with mice in their wooden cores. There are other, even more theological reasons for being anxious with regard to statuary. In Imagines, one of Lucian's characters describes the most beautiful woman he's ever seen who happens to be the Greek mistress of the Roman emperor. He constructs her as a hybrid of various pieces of Greek sculpture, the head of Canidian Aphrodite, the cheeks and the forepart of the face and the fingers from Alcamenes, etc., etc. If she sounds Frankensteinish or pretentious, I think it's intentional. Lucian is making fun of the so-called educated person of his day and how that person was expected to be familiar with sculpture. Upon hearing the speech, the woman herself is upset. This is the report that comes back from her. Such praise, she said, is too high for me, indeed too high for humankind. I am very superstitious, the term in Greek also means very religious, and timorous in all that concerns the gods. She thought, too, that it would be considered a sacrilege and a sin on her part if she should allow herself to be said to resemble the Canidian Aphrodite. So images and statuary were a risky business. They might be considered impious, as Lucian's beautiful woman argues. The matron Venuses are theologically problematic, even to the non-Christian mind. They could be taken down or reworked. They could be ignored, mistreated, left hungry and dirty with no one to care for them. Worse, they could be defaced and left intentionally to stand there to evoke the memory of a person's condemnation, the practice of damnatio memoriae. Your body and even your head could be reused. This is Claudius now, but he used to be Nero. He was recarved once Nero's uh, memory was condemned. And here in a wooden tondo discovered in Fayum, Egypt, we see what looks like and is a bitter family photograph. The emperor and the empress gaze over the heads of their beloved sons Caracalla and Geta, but Geta is missing since he was killed by his brother Caracalla, who ascended alone to the throne. And yet he is not missing. His evident erasure on display reminds and threatens the viewer a little, 
and that in itself is a teaching moment. Christians agree with other philosophical elites of their day that there's something potentially problematic about this mad passion for images, to use the Christian Athenagoras' terminology. Among others in the Roman Empire, Christians seek to train the reader's eye. They seek through rhetoric to reform vision to encourage a different scopic regime. Their writings engage in a double persuasion. One is persuaded to see in a certain way and at the same time to resist seeing in a certain way. The eye itself becomes Christianized, or to put it better, in more uh, correctly religious or pious terms, um, it is to interrupt certain messages of power and sex and ethics that Christians and others say that Greco-Roman images try to tell. I want to turn briefly to Clement of Alexandria, who wrote in the second century to flesh out one representative Christian response to the common debate about images, their value and their power at the time. In a way, like the Roman householder who bought the candelabra Doriforos, or even more like Herodes Atticus imitating Demosthenes, many early Christian writers considered themselves to be Greek and used sophisticated Greek with dense references to Greek culture throughout, so especially Clement, whose treatise to the Greeks, to whom, um, who offers his treatise to the Greeks. It's a lot of people, and it's not entirely clear who this is really going to. He writes from one of the busiest, most famous cities of the Roman Empire, Alexandria, which had a long history of struggle over images. Clement argues against those who were, quote, the first to lead people by the hand to idols, yes, stone and wood, that is to say, statues and sketches. They opened up the stupidest of customs. With slick slate of rhetoric, Clement goes on to say that humans who believe statues and images to be gods are as stupid as stones and wood. But then he turns hopeful. He draws in a reference to the saying of John the Baptist that God is able from these stones to raise children of Abraham. The petrified hearts of the Gentiles are raised to true piety through the word. And I quote, see how mighty such a new song is, Clement cries. It has made humans from stones. Stones become flesh and flesh gains hope. Clement conjures for us images of stupid stone humans, stupid because they are deceived by stone and wood gods. But these stone-hard humans looking so much like statuary are then enlivened as the image, as a kind of statue of God. Clement continues to use and reverse the language of sculpture, giving us a kind of sculptor God. We are rational images, he writes, molded by God's logos. He uses the idea of the incarnation of Christ having become human to argue for human possibility. And I quote, the word of God becomes human so that you too indeed should learn by a human how it is at all possible that a human becomes God. This should not be too much of a surprise. What we often call early Christian Christology might better be described as anthropology. Early Christians are interested in Christ taking on the garment of the flesh in part because Christ is the first fruits of their own possible metamorphosis. If Clement thinks that humans can become gods, does he approve of a phenomenon like Antinous, Hadrian's deified lover, or something like our matron Venus's? No. In the midst of talking about statuary, he makes fun of Antinous's deification, and he writes, Indeed, whole nations and cities with all their inhabitants, putting on the mask of flattery, belittle the legends about the gods, mere humans, puffing up, puffed up with vainglory, transforming humans like themselves into the equals of gods and voting them extravagant honors. Clement does and does not propose that humans be made divine through abundant statuary, which crowded him and the other Christians in Alexandria. Clement proposes that the person understand him or herself to be a quote-unquote living and moving statue. And I'm going to quote from him again. For we, we are the ones who carry around the image of God in this living and moving statue that is in our own person. This image dwells with us. It is our other half and guarantee, our associate, sharing our hearth, our co-sufferer, grievously distressed, for we have been made a votive offering, that is like a small object you would place in a temple, statue to God through Christ. Clement has argued that dumb human idol worshipers are like stone statues, then become enlivened, raised as children of Abraham, as the image of God, and then indeed through the logic of the logos, they become gods, living, moving statues of the divine. Clement plays on the busy statuary context of his day and on the landscape that repeats, he knows that, the, that flesh and stone blur as statues of still living emperors and prominent citizens stood in the public square. And he knows that the elites look like the gods. 
Amid and in commentary on this environment, Clement concludes his treatise with the, this image of humans as living, breathing statuary, as images of gods. But who is in God's image? Clement's idea of the image of God, in my opinion, is troubling. He writes, let us hasten, let us run, we God-beloved and God-imaged statues of the Logos. We perhaps imagine a great crowd of people rising up to become living, breathing statues. He then continues, and I quote, Therefore, it is time for us to say that only the wealthy and philosophically self-controlled and well-born person, and, um, and by this is pious, and by this he is the image together with the likeness of God, and to say and to believe that he becomes by Christ just and holy with understanding, and in such a way similar even also to God. Indeed, the prophet did not hide this gift when he said, I say that all are gods and sons of the highest. Like the images in the cityscape of his time, Clement too proposes a radical blurring between human and divine. But what man, and I use man deliberately, is in God's image and becomes a god? Masculine terms, which may be generic, are throughout, but are reinforced by the use of sons in the last quotation and by the image of a person with quintessential qualities of masculinity, wealth, and philosophical control. This is the landscape that repeats, in which our early Christian writers lived and moved and had their being. It is hard to imagine fully how busy a city was with large, insensate bodies. It is hard to imagine living with so many figures of gods and humans. It is impossible to know the range of interpretations which the ordinary viewer would have brought to such images. The Roman world was one where naturalistic statuary and images evoked another entire population that looked like the ones already moving in its streets. But of course, these idealized bodies did not conform perfectly to the range of bodies and faces at the time. Romans were also more willing, more than willing, to exhibit the suffering and struggle, uh, struggling and subject statues um, of bodies that they had conquered. Here is an image of the bound yet beautiful bodies of Dacians in the form of Trajan, standing under an image, which you cannot see, no longer exists, of the triumphant Trajan and in between busts of the deified emperors. On the Arch of Titus, we see Jews with their hands bound and their temple objects carried in parade as booty. In Aphrodisias, in a sanctuary to the imperial cult, we see Nero subjugating the exotic peak-capped province of Armenia, anthropomorphized as a female, as was common. Or, back to the forum of Trajan in Rome, we find on Trajan's triumphal column the fragmented bodies of the noble conquered barbarian enemy, decapitated. Many bodies, statuary and real, were abject and objects in the Roman world. Not only were statuary bodies stolen, bought, and sold, so also were human bodies of prisoners of war and other slaves traded on the market, exposed naked on pedestals in public places. Aristotle had complained centuries earlier that slaves are useful like animals and are objects or tools for human use. Although nature, I'm quoting, although nature wishes to render different the bodies of free and slaves, and all those with inferior bodies should be enslaved, hypothetically, to those who were born with bodies, and I quote, like the images of the gods. This is not how things really happen, Aristotle wrote a little sadly for his own theories. Slaves sometimes have the bodies of statuary gods. Can these enslaved bodies become the living, become the beautiful, living, breathing statues that Clement talks about and that he declares to be gods or images of God? Do Christians like Clement do something different in their critique of images? We think we might find hope in Clement's writings for the abject body. He argued, after all, that humans are all, perhaps, living, breathing statues, becoming gods or in the image of God. But Clement, too, abandons the bodies that are most used and abused, preferring to make new Christian statues out of the beautiful, philosophical, self-controlled, wealthy bodies, the very sort of elite statuary bodies that already populated the city. Thank you. And I assume, Rachel, that you want to come up? Super. Thank you, Professor Nazrala, for such a great paper. I was very much drawn to your description of the visual field of late antique cities as a landscape that repeats filled with images it's at once forcefully present and yet exceedingly malleable and recyclable so that the sculpted head of the despised Nero could be stuck on the marble body of a beloved Claudius. 
Uh, and in fact, your descriptive phrase brings the world of late antiquity much closer to us and gives, us, uh, gives the consideration of images a refreshing urgency, insofar as it seems that highly appropriate to use your, na your notion or your borrowed notion of the landscape that repeats uh, to describe contemporary North American cities and urban life filled as it is with the generic images of advertising, making each city and town indistinguishable from the next. And likewise, the language of enslavement, which you use when referring to the pedagogue, who is not only uh, the image, or which is not only the image as a teacher, um, but also who, which leads and forms our desires uh, by us kind of investing our own desire into the shape of that image, but also the slave who leads the children to school recurs today subtly in the language of branding. And so one might ask, uh, uh, when we brand product lines, are we the ones who are being branded or are we branding them? Are we today, as you put it, enslaved by iconographic power? And questions of enslavement lead, of course, to issues of resistance, or as it is sometimes put in the context of late antiquity, counter aesthetics. What would it mean, you ask, to see and resist? And I wondered here if maybe Judith Butler's work could be of some use for you. There are, it seems, really nice connections between the repeating landscapes that you describe and her notion of resistance that occurs not through the absolute overthrow of the system, but through and within the gaps that necessarily appear within the very structure of such repeatability, or Derrida's citationality. So the agency of the one who resists, then, is not a result, it's not a result of her perfect detachment from this landscape, but arises in a practice uh, within a field of enabling constraints constraints that in this case would be uh, the rhetoric of images repress, impressed repeatedly in her eye and her mind and her body. And it seems that Clement is suggesting or hinting, moving in that direction in some sense, and I thought maybe we could maybe talk more about him and his attempt to play with um, that field of constraints that he found himself in and yet did not, uh, in your argument, go far enough. Um, so he's using this raw material of the images uh, whose presence can't be ignored uh, to create a, a counter aesthetics or a different scopic reg regime. However, he still uses as his fundamental model for the deified body, the masculine, wealthy, and beautiful bodies that surround him. So I'm wondering if you're suggesting or if we could talk about, does he need to just tear the statues down completely or sh should he just have further radicalized his project? so as to expand what was worthy of being considered the archetype of beauty and a worthy gender. Do you think there really is enough slipperiness between the links in the citational chain or in the iterations of these images to make images somehow useful for a project of reimagining? And if so, what would it look like? And reading your paper, I realize that this question has relevance in a very deep way for historians of religion and your own ekphrastic practice in the paper of describing places in which the literature of late antiquity was being composed, this environment in which these intellectuals lived and moved and had their being, works not only as a rhetorical device uh, to help us better imagine the context in which those texts arose, it actually performs what you discuss in your paper, namely the oscillation and exchange between word and image and how the images that surrounded these thinkers on a daily basis inspired their literary and lived ascetic responses and how our own acts of making images in, in our historiography when we read these texts enable us to experience that slippage between these two forms of expression in our hermeneutic endeavors. So I really was just made aware again of how much history is an act of imagination in the sense of image making, very literal, and how much the images that we compose affect or lead us towards certain understandings of texts. And I think there's still a very rich kind of field for discussion in that. So thank you. As a way of saying thanks for the invitation and for the great paper, I'll try to be as brief as possible and uh, not introduce anything new, because there's more than enough in what you've given us for many nights of rich discussions. Um, I merely want to hold up something that particularly piqued my interest or stirs my imagination that I hope we can discuss more. That is the implications of the materiality of the signifier, and I'm sure I'm misusing that phrase. I just mean the material situation of the images that you've shown us and described for us. 
On the one hand, these are highly idealized images, which, as you suggest, are meant to convey transcendence, incorruptibility, nobility, sovereignty. But on the other hand, as you also point out, the very stuff of signification is profoundly material, prone to corruption and decay. I was especially struck by the image of mice chewing through the wooden cores. Uh, What's more, many of the images of nobility and sovereignty bear the traces of having themselves been colonized, plundered as war booty, and recontextualized in ways that were not always seamless. You remind us that signification does not operate in some celestial realm or on some Olympian plane. But indeed, even the most beautifully rendered and awe-inspiring symbols inhabit the world of stone and wood and rot and flesh that our own bodies call home. I'm wondering then how the cracks and seams on the surface of those bodies might have altered the regulatory and pedagogical effects of the imperial imagery and may have produced effects very much counter to the intentions of their patrons. In a very material sense, that is, how might the marks of age, weather, and abuse seen on the various iterations of statues have caused them to be misread or even to call into question the ideals that they were intended to convey? As you mentioned, the vulnerability of these majestic bodies was not lost on many Christian and non-Christian observers. I'm struck by the ways that you describe these imperial images as both exercising their own symbolic power as well as themselves opening up possibilities for subversion and reconfiguration. And here, like Rachel, I'm thinking of Butler's work. Um, It suggests, I think, that the workings of power and rhetoric in the Roman Empire, or any empire perhaps, cannot be exhausted in a single relationship between the dominator and the dominated, though that model may have value, but rather is exchanged and negotiated along multiple axes. And I think even more importantly, you're demonstrating that imperial works of art and propaganda can be seen to have functioned in the Roman Empire as a currency of that exchange in those power relationships, sometimes in unpredictable ways. So in thinking about the work that many of us are doing in women's studies and gender and sexuality, I wonder what we can learn from those fractured signifier bodies that might bear on our own understanding of rhetoric, ideology, and the discursive regulation of bodies in the 21st century. How can we learn to trace the fissures in our own scopic and rhetorical regimes and in seeking to subvert and resist the violence done to so many bodies in our own context, can we discover in the Roman statuary possibilities for embracing a shared embodied vulnerability from which even the gods and emperors are not exempt? Thank you. Um, Let me begin by also expressing my thanks for the privilege to respond to such an interesting paper. Um, you describe for us beautifully uh, Roman cities haunted by citizens of stone, cool characters crowding in on even hanging from the public and prominent places of the polis. These characters reflect the elites who commissioned them. They teach us as they taught then how these elites wish to be seen. You ask us to inhabit this landscape of anxious performativity where elites pile up images of themselves, and to ask how we might, as viewers, resist this scopic regime. What would it mean to resist the elite teachings regarding the body and its blurring between the human and the divine? What would it mean, what would it mean to view these pedagogical images as one whose body refuses this elite teaching, one whose body is owned, broken, hungry, exhausted, and perhaps most acutely for your purposes, female? Into the charged context of this built environment, you introduce two second century Christian texts, both of which seem to promise to resist the elite teaching of these pedagogical images. Athenagoras plays the euhemerist critic. All the gods rendered in stone were once mere humans. Emperors and elites, deities and demons, all are false gods, and no mob of marble will change that. Clement, on the other hand, appropriates and inverts the power of sculpture. On his construal, God is the sculptor, and we are his statues, uh, quote, rational images molded by God's word. And yet it is precisely in the specification of this we that Clement's promise seems to falter. For, quote, only the wealthy and self-controlled and well-born person, only he is the image, together with the likeness of God. Clement's use of the masculine pronoun is not accidental, as you point out, and his definition of the elite philosophical male as the image of God actively excludes precisely those viewers whose perspective you have asked us to inhabit. And so your paper ends in aporia, poised 
between promise and disappointment. Your argument certainly troubles any notion that it is the Christian rather than the pagan voices of the second century who resist the teaching of the elite. And if I'm not mistaken, you seem to find something promising in Clement's pairing of the incarnation with the appropriation through inversion of the language of sculpture, as if the notion that all humans are made in the image of God might provide resources for resisting the elite teaching of Roman sculpture, those teachings that elevate the elite philosophical male. I also find this pairing, and Clement, uh, this pairing promising and Clement's execution disappointing. And I know that the pairing has a life beyond Clement. And so if you don't mind, I wish to end by carrying the question forward to centuries and figures with which I am more familiar. And in the spirit of your paper, I'll confine myself to one pagan and one Christian. <laughs> but both, like Clement, Alexandrians. One from the third century, the pagan philosopher Plotinus. Another from the fourth century, the great architect of orthodoxy, Athanasius. In each, as in Clement, the language of sculpture is appropriated and inverted to suggest that we are somehow made in the image of the divine. In each, this appropriation and inversion of the language of sculpture serves as a critique of the sculpture they find crowding their city. And in each, as in Clement, this fact of our imaging the divine makes possible our deification. And yet neither Plotinus nor Athanasius, to my mind, so narrowly construes the notion of the image of God is to exclude all but wealthy, self-controlled, well-born men. So if there is something promising in this pairing of sculpture and incarnation, and if indeed Clement seems to squander this promise, I offer Plotinus and Athanasius not as spokesmen for egalitarian embodiment, um, but as at least resources for thinking about how our being made in the image of God can help us resist what elites now as then tell us about our bodies and to what beauty they should aspire. Thank you. Let me offer a brief response and um, especially thanks to all three of you, I hope, I think I saw some written things, I hope you will email them to me. Um, and I will respond to all three together because I think you wove in some, some similar ideas and I want to open this up as well to get everyone's ideas and more, more of ideas from the three of you too. Um, I want to start with this question of, of um, ekphrasis that, that Rachel <laughs> pointed out. I was hoping no one would catch me on that. But the truth of the matter is there's actually a huge debate going on in the second century over the power of the word versus the power of the image and the power of the orator to capture even more strongly um, the statue than the sculptor, him or herself, could do. Um, which raises precisely this idea that there is already in the discourse of the time, as I talked about tonight, a conversation about the vulnerability of images, about their kind of, uh, you know, those cracks and fissures that Bob was really talking about as well, that they could at any moment shatter. And indeed, the very practice of damnatio memoriae deliberately shows that images can stand there headless really awkwardly for a while to remind you <laughs> that, you know, Domitian wasn't so great, you know, that you shouldn't call yourself Lord and God, you know, and then expect to be considered the same necessarily for the rest of your statuary life. Um, one thing that I wanted to say by way of sort of responding to all three um, wonderful um, respondents is that one of the things that I see happening in antiquity is actually a kind of tripartite split in the conversation going on in, in the ancient world about images. And what I see is this. I think that Clement and people like him, and Charles very kindly gave you Athenagoras too, who used to be in my paper. If you want more, I can give you more. But Clement and Christians like him participate in the same conversation that Lucian and other philosophical oratorical elites of the time are are engaged in, they're doing the same thing. And what they're doing is they're creating a wedge between the elites, the imperial elites, and those of low status. So the way in which they talk about those of low status is to say that 
Sculptors sleep with their slave girls. Sculptors themselves are low-status people. And in doing so, they're kind of creating this wedge where both the imperial family and the sculptors are in the same camp of people who don't understand religion, right? They completely misunderstand how true worship of the, of the divine should happen because they actually think that it somehow re resides in the embodied, in the material, which as our people talk about, our, uh, as Christians talk about, are going to be fragmented, decay, and rot. Um, so I think that there's a kind of splitting off of the conversation that goes on in the ancient world where Christians align with pagan philosophical elites. And the bodies that are sacrificed are precisely those of low status. Um, I think uh, I'll end by just saying that in that regard, perhaps, as Charles tried to bring us into, into later time periods, um, Athanasius and Plotinus are doing something different by articulating the strand of philosophical thought that kind of moves outward several centuries about the idea um, of all humans possibly being in the image of God without that language that sacrifices those of low status and without that language that engages quite as actively um, the imperial household and imperial cult. I think with that I'll, I'll stop and see if there are more questions of that part of conversation we want to have. Yeah, so any questions or thoughts, I would appreciate them to each other or to me. No, no, I absolutely do, and I really actually appreciate also that question of what kinds of resistance are, are, are possible in, in sort of interstitial ways. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, this is when, whenever I present around ideas like this, this is a question that comes up of contemporary kind of saturation of images, how exhausted we are. I think it's actually different, frankly, to be, and I'm, I don't know exactly how to describe that difference, but I think it's different to walk in spaces where one is physically confronted constantly pressed in on by statuary bodies that are just like yours, but a little bit bigger and better looking. Um, I, I do think, I mean, you know, unless, unless we're all stalking, you know, the kind of catwalks of New York City, I think that there's something different um, feeling and sp specific about that. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking about with regard to the contemporary situation is how precisely our images, especially in terms of the news media, are controlled so that we do not see you know, in terms of the recent war with Lebanon, if you go on to certain internet sites, you will see the dead bodies of children. You will see physical mangling in ways that we don't tend to see them in the mainstream media. So how are we also um, protected? And I suppose in writing this, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, my own privilege, what I can choose to see and not see um, in contemporary culture and what I'm shielded from in terms of, of the media. I don't know if you wanted to follow that up or had no, more no, thoughts on it. something about the attenu attenuation of the photographic or digital image that gives rise to the relative desire for like transparent bodies that is also part of contemporary culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just a, I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting what kind of bodies are idealized in relationship to the media in which they're presented to us. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just a thought. Anyway, that's... Yeah, yeah thank you. Other questions or thoughts? Yeah, it, it's not quite formed yet, mm -hmm. but yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess what fascinates me, thank you very much for your paper, by the way. Very, very interesting. Very good. What fascinates me in this period in the high empire is actually the lack of thinking about the sculpture and the stature that surrounds it and presses in. There is, as you say, there's, this, you know, there's, there's the rhetors and their discussion methods and their philosophical discussions of art. Uh, but those become almost a, a form of conceit, right? Because the act process, after a while, we don't even know if they're talking about a real piece of art. Whether
whether or not that real piece of art needed to exist uh, is, is a different question. Maybe perhaps it didn't at all. But these statues are everywhere, and most people are not, in fact, talking about them or thinking about them. Um, and, and I think that's, that that's interesting. Our lack of information about what this world looked like, if we try to take seriously the question of what a viewer sees or what a viewer experiences, do you find any sources where there are ordinary people talking about this? Or? Well, actually, uh, no, it's, it's extremely difficult, right, everyone knows, as, as Nicola, you know very well, that it's extremely difficult to find everyday people talking about anything, given the kind of manuscripts and texts that remain to us. However, I actually do think there's an incredible amount of conversation in this time period, Pliny, Dio, Cassius Dio. Um, right, but that's, that's in part the nature of the texts that remain to us. Now, the, I mean, the question of how to find non-elite sources in general is a really challenging one, and I suppose, I mean, you know, everyone talks about New Testament texts being written in such bad Greek, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, think that, I think that Acts of the Apostles actually talks about this quite a bit, but I, I actually think that Luke is totally on board with the imperial bandwagon. Um, I think that Paul alludes to it a little bit in Romans 1. So the, in Revelation, hints, obviously, as all scholarship has, has been talking about lately, at this question of the spectacular. So those are places that I could go to kind of get at that. Um, otherwise, you know, no, Pliny, Pliny's, Pliny's happy. He's rich, and so is Dio Chrysostom, and, you know, all those guys. I with that a little bit, is that the statuary itself forms the discourse for the, for the conversation, and that class is built into that. For instance, you showed all the Greek women and the Venus and Mars and people. I mean, these are not produced by the elite, these are hand signers and all the sorts of stuff. This actually comes from Greek people. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's the sort of the, the people who aspire, the middle class people, who are doing these statues of themselves as the gods, which are huge and grandiose and, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be quite for us all a little bit vulgar, but they are in that way. Um, and they are responsive, so that's a form of resistance to the imperial sculpture that they see around them. Like, the, they're not writing that in the text, they're embodying it in the sculpture that they are producing. Yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, to go back to the question of what Luke is really doing in Acts, I mean, is it, is it resistance or is it just kind of imitation, um, you know, is it mimesis or mimicry, can I put it in other terms? And I guess I see it as a kind of, I, I think it's more mimesis. I think it's just sort of taking that message and perpetuating it, but it is extremely hard to know how to, how to read that. The other thing that the Romans are doing, which is particularly interesting, is the way in which they, just your question about kind of low status bodies made me think about it, the way in which they have to depict subject bodies as extremely beautiful and extremely noble, right? Because that's part of, you know, who cares if you subjugated, you know, some unattractive peoples on the, you know, east side of Dacia. You know, you want to subjugate beautiful bodies that you can bring back and use as your slaves, even if that doesn't fit in with the Aristotelian logic. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Molly. Sorry, forgive me because I don't know very much about the ancient world. But, um, but when you were talking about the... Um, what, it, what would it mean to stand in like ancient Rome or in the for, one of the foras or one of the fora and to stand there and reduce the seduction of the kind of images around you? Um, it sounded to me like when you said that you were sort of pointing at, um, kind of posing the question as what would it mean to be in the ancient world and to, to do that, but also suggesting that maybe the track of like his, of historical scholarship has been seduced in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I know I've, I've been to Rome and I think that I may have been lost by the seduction of kind of like the beautiful images around me. And I just wonder if, I, I mean, this is a really not, I just am curious to see how you see the, the work that you're doing as pushing against, kind of breaking away and pointing to new different things that are outside of, like in what ways, what am I trying to, in what ways um, your work is breaking from a historical, uh, a historical work of scholarship that's fallen into these productions. Yeah, Does that no. make sense? yeah, I really appreciate it. I was, I was afraid someone would ask me that question. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Molly. Um, a couple things. First of all, I've, I've basically, in order to do this current book project, I've had to teach myself art history, which has been really great. But of course, art history, historians are 
if any of you are in the crowd, I apologize already. Um, they're famously known for being interested in connoisseurship, right? They're not particularly interested in where an object came from or how it got there, but like how beautiful it is and, and how it can be sold on the market and how it gets transferred between various museums. This chapter that I'm working on is particularly heavy on the art historical material. Other chapters, I think, sort of correct that um, tack towards beauty or aesthetics um, by looking more at the archaeological. So, you know, really talking about how space works and how bodies would move in space, who had access to space, um, who could see a given set of sculptures, um, a, give, a given um, architecture. But it's, it's extremely well taken. And I have to say this, this particular image of the Aphrodite of Knidos is incredibly famous and art historians have interpreted it as everything from like the best woman ever to put it sort of in, <laughs> in crude terms to like the worst woman ever depending on you know how sort of where you are on the feminist scale so there's also kind of that that problem of interpretation going on where one stands in the art historical realm but I, what I what I thank you for reminding me that very much what I want to do in my work is not to see these as art objects but to see them as just parts of material culture, so not to get kind of drawn in by the, the uh, you know, they yeah, <laughs> they are. Yes. Thank you very much for this um, presentation. This is another question. Actually, listening to you brings back to my mind a period where I was really struggling with uh, what is at the heart of. Uh, what I, I come from a different culture, what is the, at the heart of uh, what we call mainstream Western patriarchy. And they think that the image lies in the, in the heart of this patriarchy. And it's better seen from a culture like uh, the Arab Muslim culture, where patriarchy is more based on space, space. Uh, whether in clothing or whatever, but their patriarchy uses space. And now listening to you, I'm realizing how easy it is to rebel against space than to rebel against the image, which engulfs you more than you, you become part of it. So it's very hard to rebel against it and to see the things that you talked at the end about, uh, how the choice you have of seeing both sides. Very, I agree with you. It's extremely hard to see the contours of the image while you are part of it. Whereas it's easier to rebel against something that tells you this is your space as a woman. That's a, your space. There's another space for a male. And I thank you very much for bringing back to me this. Uh, now I realize how important it is, except especially that it has this historical extension that you so to me. Thank you, Fatima, and that will be helpful for me too as I think about the spatial analysis. One thing that I have been thinking about in terms of both Molly and Fatima's comments on the, the beauty of these images is that we really also can't entirely know what it was like to have a body in antiquity, obviously. Well, I think about um, surrealist images of all that sort of um, fragmentation that really emerge after World War I and the processes of amputation, the bodies at war. And I wonder what was the abyss between the majority of bodies, um, the kind of medical state, the state of war at the time, and these amazingly beautiful uh, whole uh, bodies that had integrity. So that's another place that I want to go that you kind of reminded me of too. Thank you. Yes. Um, this is sort of thinking back to my friend Rachel's question, where she made the comparison to branding, which is something I'm very interested in. Um, it, was there any sort of conversation, discourse on sort of mental images, so the ways that sort of statues might affect the kind of reproduction or production sort of mental mental images or reproductions of those of that statuary and Perception, schema, whatever that is supposed to be imprinted on the body. Um, 
Absolutely. That's George, right? Okay, great. Thank you, George. This is another whole incredible topic that we could go on forever and ever with, but I'm sure you don't want to, so I'll say it briefly. Um, one of the debates of the time is how do mental images get made? And so I think I tried to use in this paper a little bit of the stoic terminology of how things physically come into your eyes and kind of impress as if you were wax behind your eyeballs. You know, impress these images, how they're sort of viscerally taken into you. And there's a lot of debate going on in the ancient world how to precisely resist that and to turn instead towards the noetic. So how do you uh, make sure that it is your highest faculty, what's generally considered your highest faculty, which is, you know, the noose, the mind. And it's that that gets the kind of, um, heavenly is the wrong word, but those, those, those images which are not real statuary sculptural images, but divine images that can come to you. How do you train yourself to see that? There's another debate that goes on, which is, well, at least vision is the highest of the senses, so how do we correctly do the, the visioning part of it? But one thing I couldn't get to in this is precisely the debate that goes on with Clement and Tatian and others about when you see something and you desire it, what is happening sort of through the gateway of the eyes to your body and what is incredibly problematic and ethically disturbing about that. And Christians are absolutely engaged in that conversation. I'd be happy to send you some of those sources if you feel like a little antique spice to uh, your contemporary question. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm terrified that actually someday I'm going to have to write on Genesis 1 and its afterlife, Genesis 1, 2, the creation story and its afterlife. It's just like, like a lifetime project, right? But there is the question of how, you know, what is the ideal human? What is, what is being in the image of God look like? Is it both smashed together, like, you know, male and female? Is it something entirely different? Is it, is it the ideal male? Um, I guess in the back of my mind when I talk about Clement, and, and I also think about the question that Charles asked at the end about, you know, what do Athanasius and people like Plotinus do differently? You know, of course, Clement Pythagoras is really famous for um, its obsession with correct behavior. You know, this is a guy who's worried about how exactly you belch and how you laugh and what you do with your body in the most common of settings. So I see him as kind of actually engaged in a real concern about uh, forming the body, whether it is in terms of this being in the image of God, which is like a statue, or whether it is in terms of these kind of social Greek cultural rules that he is deeply interested that Christians be inculcated into. You know, he wants to raise up the level of the community because he knows that it's often women or low status people and he wants them to kind of fit very properly within the Greek cultural elite framework that he considers uh, important and philosophical. Anything else? Great. Well, uh, I think we have wine, courtesy of WSRP. Uh, thank you all for coming. I, I just want to say how in awe I am of that whole conversation. That was, like, so interesting. And, and I just, like, there was so much to take in. I'm just, like, I'm going to think about this for the next year. And this whole paper and gender is really, really fascinating. But just, and also the level of the three student responses. Like, you guys are really, like, some good stuff's going on. So. <laughs> so that was great. That was really, really interesting. Thank you so much, Laura. Yes, please uh, help yourself. This is the courtesy of WSRP, who I forgot to say again, I'll say one more time, that Laura is in fact the faculty uh, associate this year. That's why they came in and beefed up this usually poor um, <laughs> event. <laughs>